From New York, this is Democracy Now! So we're just saying it. Let's, let's make it easy for you. Do what you have already done. Open up government. Any we're way. not doing a wall. Does anybody have any doubt that we're not doing a wall? So that's it. As the first and now second ever female House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi gavels in the most diverse Congress in U.S. history. Refusing to fund Trump's border wall, the Democrats pass a bill to end the government shutdown. We'll speak with California Congress member Judy Chu, who's introduced legislation to shut down a tent prison in Tornillo, where 2,300 immigrant children were locked up over Christmas. This is dangerous to house migrants out here. It's cold, it's desolate, it's not sustainable. There's a myriad of things that go on here. It, we can't monitor these places. And so that's why they shouldn't be here and they need to push back. Then, as one cabinet member after another is forced to leave the Trump administration over corruption and other issues, will Trump's labor secretary, Alex Acosta, be next? As U.S. prosecutor in Florida, he cut one of the most lenient deals for a serial child sex offender in history. Multimillionaire head fund manager Jeffrey Epstein, friend to Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, and others, has been accused of molesting and trafficking hundreds of underage girls, but served just 13 months in a county jail. We'll speak to Miami Herald investigative reporter Julie Brown, who interviewed survivors of Epstein's abuse. Her bombshell series is called Perversion of Justice. We were underage. We were little girls. I was 16. I was 16. I started going to him when I was like 14, 15, 14 turning 15. If you think at 14, $200, that's a lot of money at 14 years old. I mean, that's a lot of money now. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Incoming members of the 116th Congress made history Thursday as the most diverse group of lawmakers ever sworn in. Over 100 women now serve in the House, along with the most LGBTQ black and Latino members in history. Meanwhile, Democratic Congress member Nancy Pelosi of California was officially elected Speaker of the House again, regaining the gavel she lost after the 2010 midterm elections brought eight years of Republican control to the House. Our nation is at an historic moment. Two months ago, the American people spoke and demanded a new dawn. They called upon the beauty of our Constitution, that our system of checks and balances that protects our democracy, remembering that the legislative branch is Article I, the first branch of government co-equal to the presidency and to the judiciary. Fifteen Democrats, including some freshman lawmakers, defected against Pelosi's speakership, either voting for an alternative candidate or simply voting present. As a first order of business, House Speaker Pelosi and House Democratic leaders sought to end the partial government shutdown, passing a package of spending bills that would reopen the federal government without meeting Trump's demand for $5 billion for expanding the wall on the U.S.-Mexico border. The White House immediately threatened a veto. House Democrats also approved a rules package for the new Congress that, among other things, imposes a rule known as PAYGO, which requires Congress offset any new spending with either tax increases or budget cuts. Only three Democrats, Ro Khanna of California, Tulsi Gabbard of Hawaii and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of New York, voted no. Critics say PAYGO is a conservative austerity measure that could hamper efforts to pass progressive legislation. The House also voted to create a new Select Committee on Climate Change, to ban and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity, and to allow lawmakers to wear religious headwear on the House floor. That change will impact Ilhan Omar, a Somali-American Democrat from Minnesota who wears a hijab. Meanwhile, Washington State Democratic Congress member Pramila Jayapal said Thursday she's been given the green light by Democratic leaders to hold hearings on whether to create a federal Medicare-for-all, single-payer health care system by lowering the age 
percentage of Medicare eligibility to zero. Both the House Rules and Budget Committees are expected to take up the issue. And Democrats are pledging to use the power of subpoena to investigate President Trump, the Trump Organization, and his cabinet. New York Congress member Gerald Nadler, who now chairs the House Judiciary Committee, said this week he may subpoena acting Attorney General Matthew Whitaker over his role in seeking to derail special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation. President Trump made his first appearance ever in the White House press briefing room Thursday, flanked by Border Patrol and ICE officials. After congratulating Nancy Pelosi on regaining her gavel, Trump repeated his demands for $5 billion in new spending towards a wall on the U.S.-Mexico border. Without a wall, you cannot have border security. It won't work. You see what's just been put out on social media, where thousands of people are rushing the border. Having a drone fly overhead, and I think nobody knows much more about technology, this type of technology, certainly, than I do. Having drones and various other form of sensors, they're all fine, but they're not going to stop the problems that this country has. While Trump called it a press briefing, he wouldn't take questions. House Speaker Pelosi responded to Trump's demand by saying, quote, how many more times can we say no, nothing for the wall, she said. On Thursday evening, Trump's Instagram account posted a photo of Trump's face appearing above a steel slat border wall and the caption, the wall is coming. The caption's font is lifted from the HBO fantasy series Game of Thrones and references its signature slogan, Winter is Coming. It's Trump's latest Game of Thrones reference in a cabinet meeting on Wednesday. Trump placed a large poster on the table in front of him with the words, sanctions are coming, referring to U.S. sanctions on Iran. The poster went unremarked on, and the White House later declined to comment on it. HBO has protested against Trump's use of its trademark. This comes as the Department of Homeland Security requested that the Pentagon send more troops to string concertina wire along 160 miles of existing border fence. The move would extend the military's presence on the U.S.-Mexico border until at least the end of September. The Pentagon's border mission, which Trump ordered ahead of the midterm elections, had been set to expire at the end of January. Brazil's newly inaugurated far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro, held his first-ever cabinet meeting Thursday as defenders of the Amazon warned his administration is moving to hand vast swaths of rainforest over to Brazil's powerful agribusiness sector. Just hours after taking the oath of office, Bolsonaro transferred decision-making over the regulation and creation of indigenous land claims from the Justice Ministry to the Agriculture Ministry. The move threatens indigenous groups who live on 13 percent of Brazilian territory. Meanwhile, Bolsonaro has dropped LGBTQ protections from the mandate of his human rights ministry. He's pledged to speed the privatization of publicly owned industries, to roll back pension benefits while raising the retirement age, and he's seeking to toughen prison sentencing guidelines. In Mexico, human rights groups and family members are demanding justice after the mayor of a town in the southern state of Oaxaca was gunned down New Year's Day, just hours after taking office. Alejandro Aparicio was surrounded by supporters and publicly touring city offices when he was shot on the street. The gunman was pinned to the ground until police could arrive to arrest him. He's been described as a 34-year-old former police officer from northern Mexico. Aparicio's widow, Victoria Feria, believes the killer and not did not act on his own. We want to do everything possible to clarify this murder, because there can be no impunity. That is what we are asking for as a family, to clarify the killing and to support us. Aparicio was a member of the Progressive Party of Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador. His death came as human rights researchers said 175 Mexican politicians were killed over a 12-month period ending last August. The Trump administration's warning Iran against launching satellites, calling its space program a pretext for a ballistic missile program. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said Thursday three planned Iranian rocket launches would violate a U.N. Security Council resolution aimed at preventing Iran from developing intercontinental ballistic missiles. Iran's foreign minister fired back on Twitter, saying it has the right to a civilian space program, arguing the U.S. is in breach of U.N. Resolution 2231. That resolution saw the Security Council officially endorsed the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, which the Trump administration unilaterally pulled out of last year.
Back in the United States, The Washington Post reports recently departed Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke faces a Justice Department criminal probe into whether he lied to his agency's inspectors general. The alleged lies came as Zinke faced inquiries into his role in reviewing a proposed casino project in Connecticut and over real estate dealings in Montana. Zinke is also the subject of more than a dozen other federal ethics investigations. Newly revealed tax filings show Google shifted $23 billion to accounts in Bermuda in 2017 as part of a complex tax avoidance scheme that saved the tech giant billions of dollars in revenue. The scheme involved funneling money through Google Ireland Holdings and a Dutch shell company based in Bermuda, where corporations pay no income tax. The scheme, known as the Double Irish Dutch Sandwich, is legal, although Ireland's government has said it will close a loophole allowing the arrangement in 2020. President Trump's reportedly preparing to alter federal anti-discrimination rules and a far-reaching rollback of civil rights protections. The changes would impact so-called disparate impact regulations meant to fight practices that harm people of color, women, members of the LGBTQ community and other groups. The rollback could impact education, housing and other aspects of American life. In response, Jeff Robinson of the American Civil Liberties Union said, quote, it's shameful that this administration is considering dismantling tools to fight discrimination rather than using its power to foster respect for the dignity and equality of all people. In Texas, a manhunt is underway for the killer of Jasmine Barnes, a seven-year-old African-American girl gunned down while in a car with her mother and three of her sisters. Jasmine's mother, LaPortia Washington, was injured in Sunday's drive-by shooting near a Houston-area Walmart store. I didn't even see him. I didn't see the truck. I didn't see anything but my—but shattered glass and bullets coming towards my car. She did not deserve this at all. We was going to get coffee. Coffee. And my baby lost her life. On Thursday, police released a sketch of the killer based on the eyewitness accounts of Jasmine's mother and two of her older sisters. He's described as a white man with blue eyes and a thin build in his 30s or 40s. Police also released a video showing a red truck that was allegedly driven by the killer. The shooting has drawn international attention, with family members concerned it was a hate crime. The NFL star DeAndre Hopkins of the Houston Texans said this week, He'll donate his $29,000 payoff bonus check to help pay for funeral costs and to bring Jasmine's killer to justice. And in Maryland, a Salvadoran mother of three U.S. citizens has taken sanctuary in a Unitarian Universalist church as she fights possible deportation. Rosa Gutierrez Lopez entered, uh, took refuge in the church in the D.C. suburb of Bethesda on December 10th, the same day Immigration and Customs Enforcement ordered her to leave the U.S. Under the Obama administration, I only went to report in every year and gave my name, my address and everything, and then I would go back the next year. On the contrary, under Donald Trump's administration, I received an ankle bracelet, which was very frustrating for me. It hurts my soul because I'm not a criminal. These are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The 116th Congress made history Thursday, swearing in the most diverse group of lawmakers ever, more than 100 women, including the first two Native American women, the first two Latino women from Texas, the first two Muslim women, the first ever African American women Congress members from Connecticut and Massachusetts were sworn in, as was Colorado's first ever African American member of Congress. The first and now second ever female House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, and House Democrats sought to end the government shutdown as their first order of business, passing a package of spending bills that would reopen the federal government without meeting. Trump's demand for $5 billion for expanding the wall on the U.S.-Mexico border. What we're asking the, president, the Republicans in the Senate to do is to take yes for an answer. We have sent, are sending them back exactly, word for word, what they have passed. So we're just saying, it. let's, let's make it easy for you. Do this what is a you lie. have already done. Open up government. Let's have an adult conversation 
about how we protect our borders. And let's listen to people who know what they're talking about. The president cannot hold public employees hostage because he wants to have a wall that is not effective, uh, not effective in terms of its purpose, not cost effective in terms of uh, what the uh, opportunity cost it is of, of federal dollars to spend. And the president has said Mexico is going to pay for this. Come on, let's, let's anchor ourselves into reality. Mexico is not going to pay for this wall. The White House immediately threatened a veto. On Thursday, President Donald Trump held a surprise press briefing where he didn't take questions, but continued his call for a border wall, surrounded by ICE and Border Patrol officials. You can call it a barrier, you can call it whatever you want, but essentially we need protection in our country. We're going to make it good. Uh, the people of our country want it. I have never had so much support as I have in the last week over my stance for border security, for border control, and for, frankly, the wall or the barrier. I have never had anything like it in terms of calls coming in, in terms of people writing in and tweeting and doing whatever they have to do. I've never had this much support. And we've done some things that, as you know, have been very popular. As the government shutdown moves into its 14th day, with 800,000 federal workers either being forced to work without pay or on furlough, and they won't be paid. We go now to Capitol Hill, where we're joined by Democratic Congressmember Judy Chu of California. She's the chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. Um, Congressmember Chu is also a member of the Committee on Ways and Means, along with Democratic Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon. She's introduced the Shutdown Child Prison Camps Act. Her recent piece for the Pasadena Star News is headlined, Shutdown Trump's Child Prison Camp. Congressmember Judy Chu, welcome to Democracy Now! Congratulations on your swearing in yesterday, along with the most diverse uh, Congress in U.S. history. Your thoughts being in that room and the comparison of the diversity in color, religion, ethnicity, um, uh, sexual identity on the part of the Democrats versus the Republicans. Oh, it was just so incredibly exciting to be there with uh, the now majority in Congress. Uh, you could see the stark difference just when you entered the room as the proceedings started. And that is, on the left side of the room, where the Democrats sit, there was tremendous diversity. Uh, we have a record number of women in Congress. Now there are over 100 women in Congress, but most of them are on the Democratic side. But there is also tremendous diversity. We have the greatest number of Latinos, African Americans, and let me also say, we have the greatest number of Asian Pacific Islanders elected to Congress now. Uh, we have gone from 18 to now 20 Asian Pacific Islander members of Congress. But it is so exciting that we have now the first two Native American women in Congress and the first two Muslim American women in Congress in history. So the change is happening, uh, but the change is happening on the Democratic side, and I am so proud of it. Of course, the most exciting thing is that we now have our woman speaker, Nancy Pelosi, who once again makes history as our speaker, as our speaker for this incredible session that we have ahead of us. Talk about the legislation you passed on the first day. Uh, the first day was to be able to change the rules so that we have greater transparency in Congress, and it was also to pass bills that would end the government shutdown. On the rules issue, yes, un unfortunately, since the last few Congresses, since Republicans took over, we have had a lack of transparency. So our whole goal was to change it so that, for instance, we could have a bill 72 hours before it's voted upon so we can actually read it and contemplate it so that we can have uh, an end to these conflict of interest. So, for instance, members of Congress cannot be on corporate boards, and also so that we can have greater diversity uh, amongst our members, uh, allowing religious headgear on the floor. So those were our rules packages, but the most important thing was that we do not continue the suffering of these federal workers 
these 800,000 federal workers who either will not be paid or will be paid later and do not have a paycheck now. This is unnecessary suffering. We know that the Senate already passed a bill. In fact, we passed the very same bill that they gave to us before Trump did a turnabout for his demand for $5 billion for the border wall. Uh, so we passed two versions of our bills that will end this government shutdown. We know that there is a solution. We know that uh, Trump promised the people that his border wall would be paid by Mexico. Now he's trying to cheat the taxpayers by having the taxpayers pay for it instead. And that is wrong. That's why we are going to send the bill back and we are saying Trump sign this bill. So you passed the continuing resolution that actually the Senate had passed when Trump said he was going to sign it. And, of course, you've passed this, but it was the Republican House that didn't sign off on his $5 billion wall. But I wanted to ask you, Congressmember Chu, about the rules package for the new Congress that, among other things, imposes the rule known as PAYGO, which I know is controversial, which requires Congress offset any new spending with either tax increases or budget cuts. Only three Democrats, um, your colleague, uh, California Congressmember Ro Khanna, Hawaii's uh, Tulsi Gabbard, and New York's Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez voted no, uh, saying PAYGO is a conservative austerity measure that could hamper efforts to pass progressive legislation. Uh, Congressmember Jim McGovern um, uh, has said he won't allow PAYGO to derail progressive causes like Medicare for All. But um, why, when the Democrats are in power, adopt what they call, really, Republican legislation? Well, uh, I did vote for the PAYGO uh, provision in rules uh, because it can be easily waived. It will not stop us from contemplating bills such as Medicare for All uh, because all it takes is a majority of those who are voting to be able to waive this PAYGO requirement. At the same time, I think that the PAYGO statute should be changed and actually eliminated. And uh, let me just say that the two chairs of our Congressional Progressive Caucus also voted for the rules package, which included PAYGO, because of this waiver provision. But those same two members are also going to introduce a bill to eliminate PAYGO as a statute. And why would they do that? Well, PAYGO was a rule before, in years past, um, and, and it makes sense. if, if you. Uh, have a new bill, you should find some way to be able to pay for the provisions. But there are times when uh, it is impossible, especially if you want to pass some progressive legislation that can benefit the American people. It wasn't until 2010 that it became a statute, an actual law. And that's what um, I think does need to be changed, because under the 2010 law, uh, the person who is president can actually order uh, the payment for any bill to be implemented by those in his administration. And because we have someone like President Trump in office, he could order his administrators to cut anything that is in existence. I mean, Medicaid, um, food stamps. Uh, any of our progressive uh, programs that uh, pay for our Affordable Care Act, uh, he could actually order and cut to all of those things. And we don't want to have that situation. Congressmember Chu, we're going to ask you to stay with us, because we want to talk about what you're proposing for the Tornillo, what you call prison camp, where 2,300 children at least are being held right now. We're talking to Pasadena, California, Congressmember Judy Chu. She's the chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. Stay with us.
We're Not Alone by Carla DeVito, featured in The Breakfast Club. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. As the government shutdown heads into its 14th day, and Trump doubles down in his demands for a wall, we turn to look at the ongoing crisis on the border and the protesters on the ground fighting back. In West Texas, immigrant rights activists are staging daily actions to shut down the Tornillo prison camp, where thousands of immigrant youth are being detained. The organizers call themselves the Christmas in Tornillo occupation. On New Year's Eve, they shut down the entrance of the sprawling prison camp, where 2,300 children are being held in more than 150 tents. So my name is Denise Benavides. I am a Dallas County community organizer, and then we are here at the Tornillo Port of Entry in front of a concentration camp for Central American miners who are teenagers between the ages of 12 and 17. This is the only way we're going to shut this place down is with resistance, is with action, is with our voices, is with the stories that we hear. We're tired of this. This should not be happening in America. We are the most incarcerated country in the world, and it's sad that we celebrate freedom. Tornillo has become a flashpoint in the fight against the Trump administration's immigration policies and the growing number of detained children in the U.S. The tent prison opened operations in June with capacity for 360 children, has since expanded to hold thousands. In November, a Trump administration memo revealed rigorous staff background checks at Tornillo were waived. The facility was supposed to close December 31st, but will remain open into 2019, according to DHS the Department of Health and Human Services. For more, we're going to El Paso, Texas, where we're joined by Juan Ortiz, immigrant and indigenous rights activist, lead organizer of the Christmas and Tornillo occupation, still with us in Washington, D.C., Democratic Congress member Judy Chu, uh, who represents Pasadena and other areas, along with Democratic Senator Jeff Merkley. She's introduced the Shutdown Child Prison Camps Act. Um, Congress member Chu, explain what this act would do. Um child prison camps such as in Tornillo so that this cannot happen again. I was shocked when I went in December on a congressional trip led by Senator Jeff Berkeley. Uh, I was shocked that such camps existed. And let me say something about what I saw. Uh, we drove for an hour past civilization. Uh, past dead cotton fields, it seemed like there was nothing, and then emerging out of nowhere was a whole tent city of these gigantic white tents. And uh, as it turned out, these tent cities uh, were started because it was a way of getting around the Flores Agreement, which required that children should not be detained for more than 20 days. So it was set up as an emergency facility. They didn't have running electricity or running water. Everything had to be turned in and brought in. Uh, and there was a deliberate reason for it. That was so that they could have this detention facility be deemed an emergency facility where they could keep these children in prison-like settings indefinitely. These children didn't know when they were going to leave, and uh, they, uh, they had a way out. Actually, 1,300 of them already had sponsors, and yet they were being kept there because Trump at that time had increased the requirements for these children to be able to leave. Uh, but there they, they stayed uh, indefinitely until the point that they could be released. Well, I'd like to bring in Juan Ortiz. You're an immigrant rights activist, indigenous organizer from El Paso, lead organizer with the Christmas in Tornillo occupation, but we're way past Christmas right now, Juan. So what are you doing there? What are you calling for? So basically what we're doing now is occupying space, but since uh, it originally has started under the auspices of being there during the Christmas season and doing actions of resistance there, it wind up um, morphing into something greater because we walked in straight into, well, the people from outside of town, into humanitarian crisis. And so we were there at the Greyhound station where people were dropped off in the cold without any, any, any ability to be able to um, 
defend the weather or the conditions in which they were released. So we wound up becoming a, a, a camp that was also, um, aside from existing, also assisting the community in the, the humanitarian needs that came up during that time. And now we're occupying space to make sure it closes and to be present and um, assist the community ongoingly in terms of whatever it is that comes up during our um, with our net, with our network of partners because these things are ongoing. DHS continues to drop um, people off at the different um, now now not only Greyhound stations but also in hotels and other facilities that have been brought up just to be able to to uh, deal with the overflow uh, the massive overflow of people that are being released into the streets. But this is going to be an ongoing problem, and so. Both we are present and directing folks and resources from our base in Tornillo to the city, but we're also uh, doing acts of resistance like the day we shut down um, the shift change in Tornillo to highlight how many, uh, as the senator was saying before, how unsustainable and remote it is that they have to be bringing in 25 different busloads of, of, of uh, personnel every single night from all over the area just to be able to stain it and a constant flow of water, uh, potable water, uh, just to be able to maintain facility because it's that remote, it's the, the conditions are that draconian and uh, it's that isolated from the rest of El Paso that just to have a presence there is, is really uh, taxing even to us who are from the city just to be able to tank, uh, camp out there. Lots of our people have gotten sick, the conditions are harsh and that's just from outside, uh, uh, like yeah. just outside the encampment. Juan mm -hmm. Ortiz, um, if you can describe, I mean, in this last month, two children have died that we know of in U.S. custody, uh, actually in a remote area of New Mexico. Um, we heard about the dumping of hundreds of people by the U.S. and uh, the border officials in El Paso. You were there. Describe what you saw and the condition of the children. Uh, yes, I and Denise Benavides, who spoke earlier, and Elizabeth Vega, uh, who are from uh, uh, Ferguson and different parts uh, of, of, the, of Texas and Dallas, we all converged there on the day everyone arrived, because we're part of networks that give us a heads up when these humanitarian crises are happening. So I live not too far from the Greyhound Station, and what we ran into there was a situation in which DHS had, had left a lot, and ICE had left a lot of people at the ground stations. It was it coming increasingly colder. Um, there was a lot of people already sick. They hadn't eaten probably in days, from what we can tell. The, the children were thirsty. All these different conditions on top of people already, uh, uh, their immune systems were compromised but not eating adequately. Um, the, the adults were sick. So I recognized what it was, and, and in essence what it was, is it was the exact conditions that DHS were denying existed in their facilities and in the, under their custody that caused um, the deaths of Jacqueline and then afterwards Felipe. And actually, the, uh, Jacqueline died in El Paso, not even two miles from the Greyhound station in which um, the rest of the migrants were abandoned. Um, and she died uh, after a long battle of, of, of exposure. And that just, for me, reified that situation there, um, proved it became demonstrable what the administration was denying, that they were creating conditions in which children died. Anyone who was there that day, and we were there that day assisting, could understand that the structural violence that was enacted against those children and continues to be enacted against those children in places like Tornillo, that was proof positive for us and anyone who was there to, to witness that, that those conditions are indeed real and they're indeed ongoing. And Congress Member Judy Chu, mm -hmm. now that the Democrats are in charge of the House, um, though, uh, though the co-sponsor, Senator Merkley, of course, is in a Republican Senate, how are you going to push the closing of Tornillo um, legislation? We need to make sure that the American public knows that this is going on so that they have the same outrage that there was when the child separations was occurring. I think that most Americans do not know about these kind of tent cities. In fact, the outrage so far has resulted in at least the Trump administration saying that they are going to close it down mid-January. But we do not trust it, 
and the Shut Tornillo Down Coalition does not trust it because they could create this emergency tent city elsewhere and they could just um, have it spring up somewhere just like they did with this in which they started with hundreds but by the time we got there there were 2700 children that were being detained in that particular facility so we want to make sure that there is a permanent so solution to this problem we want to have hearings on this we want to create as much pressure as possible so that we can ensure that this will not happen again. According to the Associated Press, the government also plans to house more teenagers in another uh, temporary facility in Homestead, Florida, expanding the total number of beds from 1,300 to more than 2,300. So you see what is going on. They are just simply moving these facilities around, and the very same thing could occur in Homestead, Florida where you have thousands of children that are being detained. Uh, it is inhumane. And I could not believe it. When I went to Tornillo, I saw these children walking around in single file uh, with a guard at the front and a guard in the back just to go to the restroom. They had to have a guard accompany them. Uh, even in prisons, I have not seen uh, that kind of strict uh, control over the children. These are children. Mm. so. Uh, it is intolerable. We, we just cannot let this continue. And finally, Juan Ortiz, your message, we just have 30 seconds to people around the world from the border, as President Trump has shut down the government. We're now entering the third week, 800,000 workers not being paid or on furlough, um, demanding $5 billion for a border wall. Your thoughts? And it's important to know that this is part of a process, like the senator was mentioning. Tornillo is there because of family separations. Family separations are there because of zero, zero tolerance. Zero tolerance was there because of the criminalization of immigration. And, and what's not part of the process is this humanitarian aid that border communities have had to step up with. Our partners in immigrant families together at Movimiento Cosecha have all been taxed. Migrant Solidarity Committee in El Paso have had to step up double of their amount of humanitarian aid that they are able to assist folks. And communities like ours are being overstretched. And we, the, the system shouldn't depend on humanitarian aid to be able to save lives. That just is proof positive that the system and the, the state apparatus is broken. And that we as a community are tired of all these policies that are being enacted with no infrastructure and all these remote and desolate places along the border were not built to house and don't have the capacity to be able to uh, house human beings in, in a way that's sustainable. And so you'll have more deaths, more people on the border will have to sacrifice more and more. And, and if it, uh, and it's all part of a process which uh, is due to all these reactionary and xenophobic and racist policies directed at our community on both sides, and we recognize that. And I, I thank all the border communities and the rest of our partners that have helped us out through this process, because we are being overwhelmed, and our communities are, 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 are showing their, their true nature, are, are stepping up to the plate. To, to fill in a void that they shouldn't have to, because the, the state apparatus shouldn't have to depend on charity and the charity of people along the border who are already impoverished, who come from the communities are already challenged to be able to function, and the system is simply not functioning. Dornillo is just proof positive of, of a system, and in, 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 the system itself is in chaos, not the border. The border is the one that's been stepping up and filling in the void um, that the, and the chaos. Well, and ordering the chaos that the, the administration is creating. Juan Ortiz, I want to thank you for being with us, indigenous uh, and immigrant rights activist, uh, speaking to us from El Paso, one of the lead organizers of Christmas and Tornillo occupation. And thank you so much to Democratic Congressmember Judy Chu of Pasadena and surrounding areas and California chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, also a member of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, has introduced legislation to shut down child prison camps. Um, this is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. When we come back, one secretary after another, one cabinet member after another, has been forced out of Trump's cabinet. 
Will Alex Acosta, the labor secretary, be next? A number of Congress members are calling for an investigation into his past activities. Stay with us. The night is over and the monster is now gone. It's lived into the darkness. Cry for the Little Girl by Shawana Ray. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. One cabinet member after another has been forced to leave the Trump administration over corruption and other issues, uh, leaving Trump's cabinet at its most unstable since he's assumed office two years ago. The Environmental Protection Agency, the Departments of Justice and the Interior um, are all being headed by acting officials. We turn now to look at whether Trump's labor secretary, Alex Acosta, will be the next Trump cabinet member to go. As U.S. prosecutor in Florida, Acosta cut what's been described as one of the most lenient deals for a serious serial child sex offender in history. Multimillionaire hedge fund manager Jeffrey Epstein, friend to Bill Clinton, Donald Trump and others, has been accused of molesting and trafficking hundreds of underage girls in Florida, but served just 13 months in a Florida county jail. Fifteen Congress members have called for a probe into Trump's labor secretary. The Miami Herald recently published a series of articles exposing Epstein's crimes and the high-powered people who protected him. In the wake of the investigation, Epstein settled a defamation lawsuit against the lawyer of some of his accusers, avoiding testimonies from survivors who were expected to take the stand. A separate case to overturn the original 2008 play deal is still pending. For more, we're joined by Julie Brown. Long-time investigative reporter at the Miami Herald, past winner of the George Polk Award, Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Center Award, her series exposing multimillionaire Jeffrey Epstein's crimes is headlined "Perversion of Justice." Julie, welcome to Democracy Now. Um, this investigation is epic. Explain why you focused on Jeffrey Epstein, how you learned about his story, and give us the background. Well, I had covered a number of stories about the Florida prison system, and I had I knew that sex trafficking was a, a big problem here in Florida. And every time, quite frankly, I started to do a story about sex trafficking and do some homework on it, um, Mr. Epstein's name kept coming up. And the more that I read about it, the more I thought, I, I you know, this is something that that. I don't understand. I'm sure a lot of people don't understand how, in a state that is has a high uh, rate of sex trafficking, how does someone who has trafficked all these girls, these were young high school, middle school girls, um, over quite a long period of time, how does someone like that um, get away with, with it when, at the time that this happened, um, Alex Acosta, who was the U.S. attorney in Miami, was going headstrong into prosecuting uh, people who were purveyors of child pornography, um, sending them to prison for pr prison for decades, and here is a man who had trafficked a number, it, 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 some estimates are as many as hundreds of girls, uh, and he gets away with just serving a, a 13-month jail term term, really in a very cozy area of the, of the county jail, where he was allowed to leave um, most of the day and on work release. Now, explain so who, I essentially decided, ex explain who Jeffrey Epstein is. Talk about his rise uh, to power and who his associates are, leading right up to the president of the United two presidents of the United States, from Donald Trump to Bill Clinton. 
Well, it, it, the way that he uh, obtained his money has always been a mystery. It, it, it's almost as though no one has ever examined how he got his money. Um, it's, it, it's surprising that the federal authorities didn't look into that, because he seemed to have just a never-ending cash flow. He was able to hire uh, some of the t biggest and uh, most costly lawyers in America to defend him. He was a New York and City school teacher. He, oh, he was, he, but he never graduated from college. Very, very smart. He was uh, into physics and mathematics and, and um, biology, and he worked for Bear Stearns. And then he managed to ingratiate himself with some very wealthy, powerful people um, and manage their money. And as a result of managing a lot of uh, famous people and, and wealthy people's money, he himself made a lot of money. And it, as I said, it's really a mystery is exactly how much money he has and, and where it came from. But he has, it seems like, never-ending source of, source of cash. And he was able to really hire the best defense that his money could buy. I want to go to a video um, th uh, <clears throat> that accompanies your piece, uh, this Miami Herald expose, where we hear the voices of the young women, now older, describing what happened to them. We were little girls. I was 16. I was 16. I started going to him when I was like 14, 15, 14 turning 15. If you think yes, at 14, $200, hey. that's a lot of money at 14 I'm sorry? years old. I mean, that's a lot of money now. She's like, oh, you know, do you need to make any extra money? I'm like, yeah. She's like, okay, I can give you, know, like, $200. There's this older guy in Palm Beach. He gets a lot of massages from girls. You know, that was really great. They were recruited by someone who was adept at finding girls that would be willing to, you know, go to a house for a few hundred dollars, and as it started out, you know, give a man a back rub, but many cases it turned into something uh, far worse than that, uh, elevated to a crime, and a serious crime, in some cases sexual batteries. My life would have been different if I would have never went to Jeffrey Epstein's house. It was just a dark turning point in my life. On June 30th, 2008, Jeffrey Epstein, a Palm Beach multimillionaire hedge fund manager, received what might have been the most lenient plea deal for a serial sex offender in U.S. history. The Miami Herald identified over 60 of his victims, just young middle and high school girls at the time of the abuse. More than a decade later, several of them are talking for the first time about how they were molested by Epstein and believe they were betrayed by the very prosecutors who were supposed to hold Epstein accountable. They came from fairly disadvantaged backgrounds. There was some dysfunction in their families. The lure of a lot of money was more than they were able to resist. I went from um, an abusive situation to being a runaway, to living in foster homes, to just already being hardened by life on the streets. The other girls that I personally know of that went, were coming from trailer parks, that were having gun shootings, drugs. My mother was on drugs at the time, and she couldn't provide for me, and I was pretty much homeless. One child would be lured over, would be paid substantial sums of money, would be offered the further inducement of being paid a bounty for anybody else that she was able to bring to Epstein. A network developed where many young girls in the same kinds of circumstance wound up being victimized. The three of us slid into the back seat of the cab and we drove and I remember just driving down Okeechobee Boulevard and thinking how I had never been on Palm Beach Island before in my whole entire life that I had lived in West Palm Beach. By the time I was 16, I brought him up to 75 girls all the ages of, you know, 14, 15, 16, people going from 8th grade to ninth grade at just um, school parties is where I would recruit him from. All Jeffrey cared about was go find me more girls. His appetite was insatiable. He, he couldn't stop. He wanted new, fresh, young faces every single day. The sheer volume of girls, uh, the frequency, sometimes several or many in the same day, the age of the girls. In some cases, there were victims that didn't know each other, had never met each other, 
But they had a, basically the same story. I remember there was a staircase, and it was like, kind of like a spiral almost. And she brings us up the stairs, and it was like spiral stairs. You walked into his bedroom, around his bed, to almost a, like a very little hall, and then it was another door. And that's where everything would happen, was in his bathroom. Uh, he would have a dresser, and it was filled with like, the first drawer was lotion, and then like the third drawer down was like sex toys. So you, we would take the massage table out and set it up in the middle of the room. And then he came in with his white towel on around him. And then he just laid down in his towel on his stomach, and he was just talking to people on the phone. When he flip, flipped over, that's when he said, okay, you can go ahead and take off your shirt and pants, but you can stay in your underwear. He would want us to stand next to him, and he would masturbate while he stared at us, touched us to pull his nipples and to play with them in between his fingers and also while I was playing with his nipples he kept doing that stuff to me but he was very aggressive like when he would do it. And then he tried to put his finger in my underwear and I like jumped back and I went I pulled back and I was like whoa <laughs> and he's like no 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 it's okay it's okay I'm sorry I'm sorry I won't do that I won't do that and then he went back to doing that. He's like, just on the outside. And I'm like, oh my God. It ended with sexual abuse and intercourse. And then a pat on the back. You've done a really good job. Like, you know, thank you very much. And here's $200. You know, before you know it, I'm being lent out to politicians and to academics and to people that you, royalty and, and people that you just, you would never think, like, how did you get into that position of power in the first place if you're this disgusting, evil, decrepit person on the inside? Epstein, then in his 50s, was also suspected of organizing sex activities with underage girls at his homes in New York City, New Mexico, and on his private island in the Caribbean. You're talking about hundreds of children all over the world. Victims that were uh, ale alleged sex slaves of Jeffrey Epstein, that they broke over from Eastern Bloc countries. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of girls go through Jeffrey's swinging door, his ever-revolving door. This guy is big time. He knows people that know people that know people. Flight logs from his plane and his address book read like a who's who of some of the richest and most famous and powerful people in the world. Celebrities, actors, philanthropists, academics, and world leaders. It's really disappointing to look, as a lawyer, to look at this circumstance and say, how did this happen? One individual commits one abuse of a minor, in, in one instance of abuse of a minor, and they're held accountable for years and years through the criminal justice system. This individual abused hundreds of girls, and nothing happened. It's really, really unfortunate. We look at that and we say, how did the criminal justice system fail these girls in such a significant way? How has that happened? There was ample physical evidence and witness testimony to support the girls' stories, including notepads seized from Epstein's home with their names and phone numbers, along with phone records. Despite the corroborating evidence, Palm Beach State Attorney Barry Kersher wanted to charge Epstein only with a misdemeanor. And once that happened, it was clear to me that justice would not be served by the state attorney in the handling of the case, and we referred to the FBI. And then there were many, many more victims after that time. Epstein hired somebody that would impress the state attorney, Barry Krischer, to drop the investigation. The U.S. Attorney's Office got involved with this case, with Jeffrey Epstein's A list of defense attorneys that are extremely well known and extremely powerful. I think these attorneys were able to manipulate the sitting U.S. attorney and the assistant U.S. attorney working the cases. A few things happened in this case that during my law enforcement career I've never seen before. The U.S. attorneys here had an indictment and they were sending it back and forth to Jeffrey's lawyers for changes. Never seen anything like that before. Well, I started getting somewhat of an inclination that this is a situation where somehow, for some reason, the defendant and the government are working together against the victims, although that kind of conspiracy theory sounds so preposterous that I didn't want to believe it. 
video report produced by the Miami Herald based on Julie Brown's investigative reporting. Julie Brown is with us now. It is such an astounding story, Julie. Um, it actually goes through this day. Uh, take it from there and what happened to him and Alex Acosta's role, the current labor secretary. Now, to be clear, Donald Trump, quoted in New York Magazine in 2002, said, I've known Jeff for 15 years, terrific guy. He's a lot of fun to be with. It's even that he likes uh, beautiful women as much as I do, and many of them are on the younger side, no doubt about it. Jeffrey enjoys this social life. His plane referred to by the press as the Lolita Express. President Clinton took it uh, many times his flights. Um, but explain what happened with Alex Acosta and where this all goes from the report we just heard. Well, Alex Acosta was a uh was a Republican who was nominated um, in the Justice Department under um, President George W. Bush. He was also, at one point, in the administration, uh, in the Bush administration, as the second in charge of the Department of Civil Rights in the Justice Department. And from there, he, he, became, he was nominated to become um, U.S. attorney in Miami. And so, at the time that this case popped up in, in West Palm Beach, uh, you know, Epstein was very much as affiliated with Democratic causes. He was friends with uh, the Clintons. Um, he had donated money to um, uh, Governor Richardson in, in, uh, in New Mexico, where he also own, owns a property. He had um, a lot of important friends on on both sides of the of the political aisle but that said he um he knew at the time that since it was a republican administration and acosta was a republican that it was very important um that you know epstein realized it was very important for him to hire lawyers that had Republican connections, and that's what he did. He hired uh, Jay Lefkowitz and Kenneth Starr, who were both with the um, well-known law firm Kirkland and Ellis, and who, who Acosta knew from his days working for that same law firm. So he, they all had rubbed shoulders in the same kind of, um, you know, legal circles as well as political circles. So Epstein was pretty shrewd in, in who he hired as lawyers, even though he was more uh, aligned with Democrats. He, he knew that what he needed to do was hire Republicans, and, and that's essentially what he did. He hired uh, people who knew Acosta and who Acosta looked up to. Um, you know, Kenneth Starr, of course, was uh, someone that that uh, Costa would have looked up to, and and so it, I think it made it very hard for um, Alex Acosta to um, to 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 feel like he was going to go up against all these people. He was he was ambitious and he wanted to to go further in his political career. And there's a school of thought out there that that he um, acquiesced to a lot of these lawyers' demands because he knew that if he went against these lawyers, it probably would have hurt his his political career. And now Congress members are calling for an investigation into his role in and what has happened at this point with Jeffrey Epstein. We just have 30 seconds, then we'll do part two of this and post it online at democracynow.org. Um, well, he's, you know, he served his 13 months uh, quite a number of years ago, um, and, you know, he was released in uh, 2008, and he has basically just gone on to live his jet-setting life. And, and there are um, civil lawsuits, so he's, though, he's, now. Yeah, they, are, they he isn't affiliated with them. The, the two most recent ones were settled as soon as my story ran. Um, there is one that he's not a party to. The, several of the girls are suing uh, the U.S. government, hoping to overturn that plea, plea agreement. We're going to do part two. Post online at democracynow.org. Julie Brown, longtime investigative reporter at the Miami Herald. We'll link to her piece, Perversion of Justice. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.